What's up guys, I'm Chris McCormick. In this video, I wanna share with you what I've learned about a problem that I think must occur a lot when you're working with text data and with BERT. And that's where you've got um, some text, which we know BERT is you know, great, great for working with text, but you also have, for each of your data points, you've also got some, maybe some numerical features and some categorical features, so other kinds of data that you'd really like to incorporate into whatever kind of prediction that you're doing um, because it's got you know, additional useful information beyond what's just in the text. So that's the problem we're gonna look at. I'm gonna show you a couple solutions that um, I've dug into for that. And um, before we get too far though, I've gotta give a lot of credit, big shout out to Ken Gu and the company Georgian uh, for putting out this multimodal toolkit. Um, Nick and I were looking around for good resources on this problem of, of incorporating other kinds of features with BERT and didn't find a lot out there. Um, in particular, I was, you know, I was kind of struggling to, to find a good data set to use. So uh, when we finally came across this toolkit, that was huge because Ken's pulled together a few different data sets that are really interesting to explore. He's implemented uh, a number of different strategies. I want to say like eight or 10 and shared kind of his, you know, his benchmark results with those. So this has been really critical um, for this series and everything I've done has been, you know, kind of uh, borrowed from or built on top of Ken's work here. So thank you very much, Ken, this is awesome. So that first example that I showed you comes from a data set of clothing reviews. And I recently published a blog post slash collab notebook where I explored that data set and I applied kind of the simplest strategy to this problem. It's maybe the one that you would um, think of, think to try first. And that's simply to take the non-text features, take the, the string representation of those features and prepend them to your text features. Uh, Ken found that it worked pretty well to separate each of those by the special SEP token. Um, and that was, that was enough to uh, help Bert make sense of it. And that works really well for this data set. Uh, Ken shared his, his results in a table in the README in the project. So he called that strategy unimodal since there's uh, just one modality there. It's all, all text. Uh, and that outperformed um, all of these other you know, more sophisticated strategies as well as it, it did do better than just taking the text alone. So uh, Bert is able to make make use of those additional features. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but that's not always going to work. There's a couple problems that you can run into there. The first is that BERT, we know, has this sequence length limitation, right? You can only send in up to 512 tokens. Uh, and the longer your sequence is, the, the slower training and evaluation are with BERT. So if you're, if you're converting everything to text, then you know you're you're eating into that 512 token limit. Um, you could try Big Bird, but you know if you've watched my content on that, then you know that Big Bird isn't the perfect obvious solution. It, it uses um, an approximation technique, so it's kind of fundamentally less accurate than Bert. So might be worth a shot. <laughs> um, the other issue is that the numerical features. Uh, if they're, if they're more complex, then I wouldn't expect BERT to be able to make good use of them. So a good example would be like square footage. If you're trying to predict the price of a home, um, it might be difficult for BERT to take advantage of the fact that uh, you know, a home that's 2,000 square feet is probably worth twice as much as a 1,000 square foot home and um, half as much as a 4,000 square foot home, right? If they're all kind of in the same area. So, uh, you know, other examples I tried to come up with, like if one of your features is a percentage or uh, the worst one I could think of is like a sensor reading, some, some kind of like nasty looking floating point value, right? I think Bert's gonna have a really hard time doing anything with, with a number like that. I think for the clothing review data set, it may have worked well because the numbers were just kind of simple integers. The, especially the most important ones were just like uh, the numbers one through five. So um, I could, you know, believe more that, that Bert was able to, to utilize those. 
So we're going to look at a data set of Airbnb listings. And uh, this one's great because the unimodal strategy doesn't work as well. So it's a great, um, great data set to play with for you know, trying out some other approaches. This Airbnb data set actually has something like 275 features. But uh, for his benchmarks, Ken narrowed it down to less than 100. And we're ultimately going to use three text features, such as like the summary of the listing, 10 categorical features, such as the property type, uh, 15 numerical features, like the number of bedrooms and bathrooms, and then 60 binary features, where each of these is just a particular amenity and whether or not that listing has that amenity. So whether or not it has Wi-Fi, pool, bathtub, that kind of stuff. So I'm going to take us through a, a notebook where um, I've implemented one of the strategies from the toolkit, um, kind of re-implemented it with uh, an emphasis on, on readability in, instead of you know what the style that you'd expect from a software library. So I'll take us through that, but first let me give us uh, let me give you some overview of the approach. Um, here's kind of the the high level picture of of how we're going to attack this problem. So the text features are going to go through Bert. Uh, the categorical features I actually decided to include as text as well. I'll talk about that more on the next slide, but uh, we'll send that through Bert and. On the output, we'll take the CLS embedding. That's the embedding that um, we use from BERT to do like class, uh, classification tasks, or in this case, regression. We're going to try and predict the nightly rental plate, uh, price of the listing. So we'll take the, the CLS embedding from BERT, which has 768 features. And then the binary and numerical features, we're just going to um, concatenate on to the end of that CLS embedding. So for the simple illustration here, I just pulled out four uh, numerical and binary features. So that would mean a, a total vector length of 772 features. There'll be more, of course. So we'll, we'll, put, we'll concatenate those features with the, the embedding. And then that final vector, we're going to send through a multi-layer neural network to do our actual pricing prediction. So there are actually a few different ways that we could handle those categorical features. Um, if we wanted to keep them outside of BERT and actually send them through the MLP instead, then you know, we need some sort of numerical representation for uh, those categories so that the MLP can, can take them in. So you know, one way to do that would be to assign a unique integer to each of the categories. Um, however, this is a bad idea for an MLP. An MLP requires that the distance between the values is a reflection of how similar those data points are. And here we're just assigning arbitrary numbers to the different categories. And you know, taking the, the difference between them has no has no meaning, right? It doesn't, it doesn't convey anything about their similarity. So this is a bad strategy for uh, what we're trying to do. An alternative that does work for feeding the category into the MLP is to do one hot encoding. So we're going to, um, if there's seven category values, then what we're going to do is we're going to expand that one categorical feature into seven binary ones. So if this listing is a townhouse, then we'll put a one in the townhouse feature and then a zero for the other property types. Um, so yeah, that then allows you to feed that into the MLP. And that's the strategy that Ken took for his benchmarks. Uh, I thought it might be a little more clever to try using the text label with BERT, since that did seem to work really well for the clothing review data set. And I figured to you know, try something different than uh, uh, what Ken did, just to see how that works out. One, one other consideration here is the normalization of the numerical features. So this is kind of standard practice if you're working with tabular data. Um, we've been looking a lot at text, so uh, you know this is maybe a little foreign, but um, the integer, the different in, uh, numerical features have different ranges. And uh, that's a little rough for the MLP. So we have 
you know, security deposit, which could be in the hundreds, and then um, number of bathrooms, which is, you know, some small integer value. So the different uh, ranges and means can um, be a problem for the MLP. So standard practice to normalize each of those features separately so that they have a mean of zero and then a, um, a similar range. So we'll, we'll do that as well before sending those values to the MLP. Now that you've seen the you know, kind of overall architecture and process that, uh, that we're using, I wanted to take you through the, the notebook where I've implemented um, all of those pieces. And we'll start by looking at the data set a bit, and then uh, I'll show you some of the, the key parts of the implementation. Um, so yeah, so this is a Airbnb data set from around uh, listings around the Melbourne, Australia area. Uh, I'm uh, out of town this week and, you know, appropriately, I'm staying at an Airbnb, not in Melbourne, Australia, but <laughs> still a good uh, coincidence there. So the, the data set comes from the multimodal toolkit. So we're going to we're going to download the train and test CSV files. Uh, parse them in with pandas, and then I actually combine them into one data frame uh, to simplify the uh, those like numerical and categorical transformations that we need to do. Uh, but I added this split column so we can separate them back out later. So we'll just combine those. All right, so we can take a peek at some of the features and uh, get a sense for some distributions, things like that. So first of all, the prices, the prices range from $12 a night to $12,624 a night, uh, with the median price being $112. So we can, uh, you know, turn that into a distribution plot. Um, I clipped all of the prices to $800 a night so that the, the plot is a little easier to read. So, um, this bar represents, you know, everything at 800 and above. Um, so yeah, most most are you know under three under three hundred dollars a night, and then uh, there are a smattering of <laughs> uh, rentals above that. So the twelve thousand dollars a night, right? That's that's pretty uh, that had me pretty curious. So in the appendix, I did kind of I went through, sorted the uh, listings by price, picked out the top ten, and each one actually has an image with it. So uh, I looked at some of the images. Um, some of them are plausible, like this, this uh, place looks really cool. Um, it rents for 2,500 a night, so even this doesn't cost 12,000. Um, this one is one of the $12,000 a night ones, so I think something fishy is going on there. My guess is um, either, either it's an error or maybe it's sort of like a, a strange way for the, the host to temporarily like disable their their listing by just, you know, uh, listing it at an obscene price so that no one would actually book it. Just a guess. Um, so because those, uh, because there are these outliers like that and we're doing a pricing prediction, I wanted to filter out those bad data samples. So, um, I found from looking at these that, you know, this, this guy is 2,500 a night and it's legit. This one's not. So, it looked like I could actually filter out anything above uh, $2,500 a night. And that only filters out, what is that, like 10, 10 listings. So not a big change. Um, I was curious to see whether, uh, like what would happen if, if we simplified the benchmark a bit by limiting it to only the listings that are under $500. Um, so just did some quick statistics there. 2% are above 500, 1.5% one, one are above 600. So I decided not to, to do any further filtering in the data set. So it still goes up to 2,500, uh, but it could be something to try just to see whether those, those higher priced places are, are kind of screwing up our, our accuracy on the lower priced ones. Um, all right, let's look at all the different features because there's a lot, there's 275, but most are these binary ones that we'll look at in a second. All right, so 275 features, but the first, what is that, 84 are, uh, first 85, <laughs> I don't know, are kind of attributes of the listing. So let's take a look at these guys. 
Um, some are clearly not useful, ID listing URLs, scrape ID less scraped. Uh, but there are some text features here that we'll use, the name, uh, the summary. I'm not sure what the difference is between the summary and the description, maybe they're the same. Um, some others there that aren't filled in. A lot of stuff here about the host. And then a bunch of stuff about the location of the listing, street, neighborhood, city, suburb. Those seem like valuable, um, uh, valuable details since you know price often is heavily tied to location. There's even an exact latitude and, and longitude along with this feature is location exact to tell you whether or not it's precise or approximate. Um, property type, room type, those seem valuable. How many it accommodates, bedroom, bathrooms. There's this, um, they all have a list of amenities. And I learned that uh, what Ken did is he actually created um, binary features for all the possible amenities. So the next big chunk of features all comes from that list. So there's the price, that's our target, that's what we're trying to predict. Some stuff here on review scores that are empty, at least for this listing. All right. Yeah, so next, next big chunk of features, basically the rest of the features are binary and they just represent whether the listing has a particular amenity or not. So espresso machine, pool toys, smart TV, exercise equipment, soaking tub and fire pit. It's all sounding pretty fun. Okay, and then the last two are some extracted text features. So the length of the description, length of the summary. Uh, well, there you go. That tells us something about the difference between the two. They're not the same length. So maybe the description is the is a longer form of the summary. The summary is a shorter form of the description, rather. Okay, so amenities. Um, I was kind of curious to see how many amenities um, each listing had, because if if the if the number of amenities isn't that long, then it might be interesting to try um, treating them as text features to include in the in the input text instead of uh, as these binary features. Um, so I went through and counted up the number of amenities for every listing. Uh, minimum's one, median's 23, max is 84. I'm looking at the distribution, looks like they've typically got between, I don't know, 10 and 35, <laughs> something like that. So I think it's, I think it might be worth a shot. It, you know, it's, uh, if every amenity, if the amenities on average take two or three BERT tokens, then, uh, you know, 20, 20 amenities might take 60 tokens on the input. So a little costly in terms of sequence length, but, um, I don't think it'd be crazy to try. So that'd be further work. All right, and then uh, looked at some of the categorical features just to see what the values are. It's curious about room types, cancellation policies. So there's three room types, entire home, private room, shared room. Cancellation policies, there are what? One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, property type. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> I don't know how many there are here. What is that, like five rows, six rows of five, so like 30 or so. Um, but what are some good ones here? Castle, yeah, <laughs> hut, train, earth house, boat, awesome. Okay, so uh, the features that I chose to use, I, I took from the toolkit. Um, the one difference is that the categorical features that Ken shows, um, I'm treating as text instead of doing the one-hot encoding. So in the end, uh, because I'm treating those categorical features as text, I've got a total of 13 text features, 15 numerical ones, and uh, 60 binary ones. So Ken um, picked out 
uh, this set of features to use. So I'm, I'm um, copying his selection and I've just got those listed out here. Anyway, cool. Next, let's look briefly at some of these transformations that we need to do for the non-text features. So for those binary features, they're stored as uh, T and F, true or false. So we just need to change those to one and zero. Um, rather than doing a simple replacement, I kind of reuse the, the code from the clothing review notebook. Uh, so this code is designed to be able to assign more than just two integers for the category, but um, yeah, a little overkill. So you can use this, uh, this cat as type category feature of uh, pandas to um, have it automatically assign category values for you. Um, and then we just need to convert those to, we need to get the codes out and convert them to floating point. So. Yeah, so once that's done, instead of T and F, we've got 1.0 and 0.0. All right, a little more interesting. We want to normalize the distributions of the values for each of those numerical features. Um, so here's, here's what they look like before normalization. Got some small integers, some large numbers for security deposit. Uh, we're going to use the quantile transformer from the uh, scikit-learn library. This is what Ken used. Essentially, it's just going to transform the, the values to have a Gaussian distribution, a you know, bell curve. Um, I think the quantile transformer has a, some, some logic in it for handling uh, outliers. So I think that's maybe the difference. Um, yeah, and there's probably a way to, there's probably a better way to, to do this, to apply that transformer to like all of the numerical columns. Um, but I, I'm i not that good with uh, with navigating pandas, and I wanted to make sure that each column was being transformed independently, right? Each feature needs to have its own transformation. Uh, so what I did is I kind of iterated through the, the numerical columns, selected the column, um, Need to replace any empty cells with a number to zero. Needs to be needs to be a two-dimensional array. Yeah, so create a quantile transformer, a normal normal output distribution, and then apply it. And then replace replace that column in the original data frame with the, the normalized values. So once that's done, here's uh, here's what those integers turned into. It's interesting to see with um, accommodates and bathrooms, since there's a pretty limited number of values that those take on, uh, you see kind of the same, even though it's this very precise floating point value, you see it used multiple times. All right, so those features are ready now. And then the text features, pretty straightforward here. Um, taking the each of the uh, text features, going this is for like going one row at a time, and for each text feature, um, take the string representation and separate it with an SCP token. That worked well for Ken, and it's uh, pretty pretty efficient in terms of token use. So I'm using that here. Yeah, and then it's the, um, yeah, so then we have just one one text column now, one text feature that I just, you know, named text, and that's got all the features combined, all the text features combined into one string. Yeah, and then it's the normal tokenizing and encoding of the text. So the next thing to look at is the actual implementation here. So in order to... Uh, in order to implement that architecture that we looked at, we need to create a custom BERT class, um, kind of building on top of the Hugging Face Transformers library. 
So we'll, we'll define a class that's based on BERT for sequence classification. I'm going to call it BERT concat features. Uh, this is taken from the multimodal toolkit. I kind of uh, took the, the relevant pieces of code from there and then just, you know, simplified things, collapsed things a bit, removed all the configuration options, that, that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, we will need a, a multi-layer perceptron or MLP class. Uh, that's going to be our, our model on the output to generate the, the price prediction. Um, so that's, that's defined in the toolkit because the MLP isn't really like, you know, uh, specific to what we're doing here. I, I took the code from the toolkit and, and didn't, didn't comment it in the normal way that it, that I would. Um, but the BERT can, BERT can cap features class was, is what we'll look at in more detail. Yeah. Uh, one, one interesting thing to note when normally when we use BERT, BERT's this really powerful model, right? And so all we need on the output is just a simple linear classifier in order to do classification or regression. Um, and that's because there's so much expressive power inside the BERT model that it can encode everything it needs into that CLS embedding um, to make the classification simple on the output. Here though, we, we've got BERT handling the text features, but then we've got these other features uh, outside of BERT that we want to be able to, to utilize. And in order to do anything intelligent with those, or you know, sophisticated, I guess you'd say, um, we need more than just a simple linear classifier. We want a multi-layer neural network that um, has the expressive power to do some of its own you know, feature extraction or uh, transformations to those values in order to make the best use of them. So. That's why we're using an MLP this time instead of just a simple linear layer like we normally do. So here's the MLP. Again, not commented, so I'm just gonna breeze on by there. Um, but we'll we'll see a little bit more about it in, inside this, this class. So we're inheriting from Berk for sequence classification. And in the initialization, we, we call the constructor for that transformers class, the hugging face transformers class. So that's going to do all the BERT related setup. Um, that's going to, you know, define that model and initialize it. Um, and then the, the result is the BERT model stored as self.BERT. So pretty big, pretty important step, all just kind of hidden behind this one line. Um, but that's all, that's all stuff we're going to, you know, build on top of. So now we want to set up our, uh, feature combination step. Uh, we need to know the number of labels because if it's, if it's just one, then we interpret that as a regression task. If it's more than one, it's classification. So for example, if there's two labels, then that's binary classification. Anything more than that is multi-class. And then in order to build our MLP, we need to know the combined vector length when we take the CLS embedding plus those additional features. So uh, text feature dimension is uh, 768. That's the bird embedding size. And we've got the number of categorical features and the number of numerical features. So add all those together and you've got your, your final vector length that needs to go into the MLP. Um, Batch normalization for the numerical features. That's something Ken did that I just kind of uh, maintained here. I'm not that familiar with that element, but um, I think it's just one of those um, things to, you know, to help with training, to <laughs> avoid vanishing gradients or exploding gradients, those kinds of things. Um, all right, so, so for the MLP, uh, we need to decide on a number of layers and a number of neurons per layer. And there's a, a formula in the toolkit for doing this. Uh, what they did is um, starting with the, the size of that final vector, they divide that by four uh, for each layer. So each layer has one fourth the number of nodes as the previous layer. So we'll start with that combined feature vector length and then keep dividing it by four, truncating to an integer until we get down to the number of outputs. And then uh, when we initialize this, we'll, we'll print out the, the layer sizes so we can see that. All right, so 
once we've got our the number of layers and the number of neurons per layer, we can initialize our MLP. Okay, and then we need to define the forward function. This is um, defines kind of the evaluation of the model, how, how data flows through it. So first step, we're going to send text through the BERT model. Uh, we're going to invoke self.BERT. That's going to return the outputs from the encoding layers, uh, not from the final classifier that BERT for sequence classification would add. So we'll run it through BERT. Um, take the CLS embedding. Apply dropout. Apply the batch normalization that we looked at. And then we just concatenate all those features together. <laughs> Got our CLS embedding, categorical features, numerical features. It gives us our final vector. I'm going to send that through the MLP and get our logits. Um, copied some code here from the toolkit. Not exactly clear what's going on with the, the formatting of the output, um, but either way, we'll get our we'll get our logits and our classifier layer outputs. So if we're doing training, we need to calculate the loss. So if, if labels have been passed in, then we know we're doing uh, we need to calculate the loss. So and then if the number of labels is one, we're doing regression, which is what we're doing for this application, using the mean squared error as our loss. So we'll apply that to the outputs of the MLP. Yeah, in classification, we would use cross-entropy loss, softmax. All right, and then we return the loss logits, the, uh, the output of the MLP. Um, is that right? Let's see. Logits and classifier layer outputs, yeah. I believe it's just the logits that we look at in the end. We'll see in the training code. All right. So I can show you how we um, load the model. So something a little different here. Normally, um, uh, part of the Hugging Face Transformers library is they have this BERT config class. We don't usually use that in, in our notebooks. Um, it's not needed. You can use uh, uh, from pre-trained most of the time. Here, though, we need to pass in some additional parameters. We need to tell it the number of numerical features and categorical features. So we're going to use that config op object this time. Um, so we can initialize the BERT config from an existing model, BERT based uncased. And then we're just going to add in, uh, you know, these, these uh, attributes of BERT config don't exist, so we're just kind of forcing these onto the config object. And then we'll pass that when we load our BERT, BERT concat features model. So this is where we'll get the layer sizes. All right, so. Um, that CLS embedding plus our additional features in the end is a total of 843 features. So that's the size of our uh, combined vector that goes into the MLP. The hidden layers, we've got four hidden layers, 210 neurons, 52, 13, and 3, and then one final output. All right, training parameters. I, the one thing I wanted to point out here, the, the learning rate um, is much larger than what we would normally use for fine-tuning BERT. Uh, and I assume that's because the MLP, we're not fine-tuning the MLP, we're training it. It's got randomly initialized weights, whereas BERT has a lot of pre-training done, right? So the, the idea is that the BERT weights, we're not, uh, we're not adjusting as much, we're fine-tuning those, but the MLP needs to be fully, uh, fully trained. So, yeah, three... 3 to the negative 3 uh, compared to like 3 to the negative 5. Um, I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> 
three thousandths versus three hundred thousandths. <laughs> there we go. All right, four epics. Yeah, I'm using the sequence length of 300 here. Anything else that looks different? Check out the training loop. I think the training loop is mostly the same. You'll see that in the as we pass the inputs to the model during training, um, we now have these additional parameters. So uh, this is all the usual stuff, but then we've also got the categorical features and the numerical features that we're passing in. All right, yeah, and then we are looking at the logits. Once we've trained our model, we can run it on the test set. And there's uh, two different metrics that Ken used for his benchmarks. We're doing a, a regression task, so the, the metrics are a little different. Um, one is the mean absolute error. So to get that, we simply subtract the predicted price from the actual price, uh, take the absolute value of the difference, and then calculate the average of that. Um, I'm actually having some issues right now with Colab and getting a clean run of this notebook, but from a previous run, I got a value of 90.12, um, which feels kind of bad to me, right? It's like, that means that on average we're $90 off of the correct price. So not a very accurate model uh, from my perspective. The second metric is the RMSE, which is um, root mean squared error. Very similar metric, except that we, instead of taking the absolute value, we square the difference and then take the average of the squared differences and then finally take the square root of that. Um, so that gives us a value that it, uh, should be um, close to the, the MAE, but um, it's more robust, or excuse me, it, it more heavily punishes <laughs> large errors. Uh, because of yeah, because of this squaring step, so it'll always be a worse score than the MAE. Um, so they're getting 156. So the the benchmarks on the the toolkit page um, they showed using this method. They they called this method concat. Uh, they got 65.68 for the MAE. Um, all of these scores are better than the MAE. I got 90. So I'm not sure what to attribute that to. Uh, I know, you know one difference is that I chose to include the categorical features as text rather than do the one-hot encoding, uh, but I'm not sure if that would be enough to explain the difference. So something's still, still kind of going on there. Also, the RMSE is a little strange because um, every experiment I've done, I've, I've gotten a better RMSE than these. So, you know, including this one, right, 156. So uh, I'm a little suspicious that this RMSE value wasn't, there's something off with the calculation of it um, when uh, Ken ran his benchmarks, but I don't actually know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would say um, a big takeaway from all of the all of the research and discussion we've done on this topic is that it, it definitely seems to be one of those uh, problems where there's not really one obvious solution and there's just different ideas that you can try and it, it's probably going to be a lot of experimentation um, kind of feels like a Kaggle competition to me right you just got to try lots of different features see what's most helpful do a bunch of feature engineering um, yeah but hopefully this is a good starting point. Um, you can take this code and modify it, or you can also run the toolkit. The toolkit's got a number of other different strategies implemented in it. Um, there is a command line interface for it, so you can specify just the training parameters, your data set, and then um, a JSON object that specifies which columns are categorical, which are numerical, and which are text. So it should be relatively easy to, to apply it. All right, I think that's everything. Thank you, guys.